Open Access Publishing is making the work that we produce freely available to read by anybody and also publishing it in a way that uh, allows for its reuse through the use of an appropriate copyright license. In all cases, the point is that you're making the work available to those who ultimately funded it. So in 2021, it was the first time, the first year, where the number of STEM articles published open access was greater than behind paywalls. Funders have been driving the open access agenda for at least 20 years and continue to do so and are supported by journals who are now increasingly offering open access publishing options. What open access looks like is going to differ across different disciplines. So those disciplines that tend to publish journal articles, for example, will require open access to look slightly different to those that tend to publish in monographs. Open access for the humanities, or for me at least, is more being able to enrich the published version with the manuscript images, with metadata, with the raw transcript, with translations into different languages. So it becomes a whole universe of knowledge. I first got involved in open research by frustration with the current publication model, as it were. My first first author publication was through a journal that's quite well known and that had restrictions in the way it could be disseminated and also uh, payment costs that I thought were somewhat exploitative of the people who were doing the research or could have benefited from it. Making sure that the research that we generate is as widely available as possible is an important motivation behind open access publishing. That means that by publishing open access, we can ensure that a wide range of communities can access and use that research, both academic and non-academic communities. Some of the advantages of open access, in addition to enabling collaboration and increasing the reach of your science, is that it has demonstrated um, increase of citations as well. It allows people to build on your research. And so your data can be collated with other data to, to do meta-analysis or other aspects of your data that you had not looked at can be looked at by other people. Um, and so it enables scientific advance. Especially in, in the area of volcanology I work in where it's like, you know, we're dealing with people under threat of volcanoes. In order to hold back a knowledge that would be useful in protecting people's lives or livelihoods, in order to just say, well, I'm the sole you know, holder of this knowledge, it's not beneficial. And there's, you know, there's, there's enough volcanologists around that no one can kind of lay claim and say, this is my volcano, this is my thing. Open access can really help with researchers' visibility. If you suddenly meet somebody who has heard of your work from across the world, uh, you can start a conversation on a completely different level than if you have to start it from scratch. But it's also very satisfying uh, for the broader public, where they can follow a researcher on their way into uh, the backstory of a manuscript. There are different levels of open access. There's diamond open access, which means uh, articles are open access immediately upon publication and they are free to publish. Uh, there's gold open access, which uh, means articles are immediately available upon publication, but there's normally a, a fee to publish. Um, then green open access means it's the green is because it's compliant with with mandates posed by funders, and they are usually available at a repository like PubMed Central, so not directly at the publisher's website, although it could be that it's open also at the publisher's website. So open access continues to be a rapidly evolving area and there are a number of innovations that are emerging intended to promote the uptake of open access. For example, Coalition S is promoting an initiative called the Rights Retention Strategy. These new approaches to open access may provide models that can be applied across different disciplines from STEM disciplines through to the humanities, disciplines that publish in very different ways. From medieval studies, I try to make as much of my knowledge behind the publications accessible by, for example, running a YouTube channel uh, where we'll record me talking about it by having the institutional pages free to access to everybody. And um, Twitter has become a really important tool for medieval researchers to reach a wider audience, but also to communicate across disciplines. Digital methods have 
brought uh, the Middle Ages to life again in ways we couldn't imagine even 20 years ago. One of the challenges is that you have publishers whose business models rely on either subscriptions or on open access fees. That means that there's a cost associated with some of the models of open access publishing that have emerged over the last 20 years. The growth in preprint servers is allowing for much more scope for publishing via, for example, a green open access route that doesn't require paying a fee. So what we've seen, for example, is a drive very much on the part of the funders to promote this agenda, but also a great deal of innovation, much of which has come from researchers themselves. However, there are still challenges in coming up with a model that can be applied across a broad range of disciplines that publish in very different ways. Some of the worries about open access is that, of course, open access, because it started with an author pays model. And so there are a number of bad actors, if you will, that are putting out papers that may not be of excellent quality. Having said that, there are a lot of very serious publishers, PLOS included, um, who publish open access uh, with the same um, quality requirements and advanced requirements, etc., as, as the traditional journals. My experience of open access versus non-open access has been perhaps slightly slower for open access, maybe a month or two versus a, across, you know, a greater than six months from submission to publication. I would say that the, the slowness has been worth it. In general, I just, I think it's worth taking a bit of time to make sure that you've really got something good there. So open access doesn't impede that at all. If you are discouraged, look at, think about the people who are discouraging you, where they're coming from, and probably do it anyway. Most of the editions that I'm doing with the students would be published much quicker if I did them on my own, rather than correcting what comes in from the students. But uh, doing it in this crowdsourcing way ensures that what we are publishing isn't just this one book, that it, we are educating the next publishers. One of the really interesting challenges we're facing at the moment is what should the future of scholarly publishing look like? The concept of the journal, for example, is 400 years old, and many journals that are around today were around back then and continue to publish in a very similar format. But of course, the way in which academic research is conducted has changed enormously over that period. And so we're seeing lots of innovation happening. Publishers themselves are very engaged in this. I think they recognise that they need to remain relevant. And as a result, we're seeing exciting new platforms and approaches emerging. Increasing numbers of journals and publishers are switching open access. Again, this took a long time to fly, but now the funders are increasing their mandates to open access because they're saying the science that is done with money they pay for should be open for everybody to read. I have had a really good experience of open access with a, a particular journal. They allowed us to publish with a second language abstract in Spanish and to provide all our additional information in both languages. So for me, that's a really kind of key cornerstone of uh, both good open access practice, but also open access practice for a model that's wider than the UK. There has been a real transformation of how humanities present themselves and are perceived. You can see it here in Oxford, which when I first came for a year to Oxford in 2001, it still was an ivory tower. And uh, the building we are sitting now in, the Western Library, has really become an interface to, to the public, to a tourist just walking through Broad Street, being invited to come in, uh, perhaps just having read a Tolkien book and then being drawn into a medieval manuscript. Building bridges has been made so much easier through open access.